now we're heading into Soho. We was very much a West End band, really, the Pistols. Soho was our hangout, really. The clubs, Louise's and stuff like that, and the Speakeasy, and Denmark Street was here, where we used to rehearse. Our office was here. People seem to think we're more of a West London Chelsea band, but it's not really. So Soho was our manner, as it were, at the time, you know. Oh, in my day, I tell you, it changed here. Yeah. It really changed. Yeah, what's that here? Look, Busty Charmer. Yeah, here we go. That's a good. <laughs> Come and meet first floor. No rush. Hot time. I think I might go up there. Well, he don't want you. Montana. You think he's a bit more than the tenor nowadays. I know it's seedy now, but it was even worse then, really seedy Soho, much worse. That's better. She was great. Wear no, it. no rush, hot time, brilliant. She made me wear a Johnny though, I wasn't thrilled about that. I couldn't contract any gonorrhea. These were the toilets where we used to hang out. And ladies' ones, of course, not, not the blokes. Surprised they're still open. Now we know where to come if we're dying for a piss. It's great down here. Come down. Ugh! Ugh! Those dirty old men down there. A lot of cottaging going on. La 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 la. That means strong. Strong leg boy. Wanna to go to Louise's? Now Louise's? Was that it? Or was that it? This was the famous Louise's club where we used to come and hang out. It was a lesbian um, bar where all the underground weirdos congregated way before the uh, the punk thing started really. We went down there a lot and it was a fun little hangout. I think we used to think we was really decadent coming here and Hanging out. It's the only place to come though. After after we played at the Marquee or the Hundred Club, we'd uh, come back and have a late night drink here. The Marquee Club on Wardour Street it was the first show we played where we actually heard ourselves on monitors. We were opening up for a band called Eddie and the Hot Rods. And when John first heard himself on the monitors, he freaked out because he never heard himself. And he kicked the monitors into the into the audience. And there was a big old ruckus and we got a bit of press out of it. And I remember the interviewer, some bloke come up to me, that's where this line came from, he said to me, what are you into afterwards? Because we all run out. And I said, we're into chaos. I don't know why I said that, but it kind of stuck. It was one of them punk words. I mean, the other thing we were doing a lot was playing other places around London and turning up to play, saying we were the support, firmly believing that we were the support band because Malcolm had told us. And he hadn't spoken to anybody about it. We just turned up and we were so convincing in the fact that we were the support band that they let us play. But we haven't been booked, so we're kind of gate crashing gigs for no money. It's a bit, it's a bit oil I wonder where that phone box was. Now, this might have been the, um, Telephone box that we did the famous all squid drink picture in. Might have been. I wonder what the other guys think. So I think this is the actual phone box where we took the famous picture actually. Let's, let's try, you'll soon find that. <laughs> Looks like a red phone box. A telephone on the top there. I think it is it. I think this is the one. Looks like the one to me. <clears throat> Looks like the phone box. No, I believe it was my idea, yes. <laughs> Thank you. There's the GPO tower. Post office town, that's all, which was blown to bits by the IRA around that time, I believe, wasn't it? I like it though, it's a nice building. Where was the uh, Notre Dame? It's down there. Oh, it's down there. Now, was it this one or was it the next one? It was down there, wasn't it? Do you know where the Notre Dame Hall is? Notre Dame Hall? Notre Dame Hall? Yeah. Party. What? Party. Party? Party. 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 Oh, Paris. No, there was one here. 
The Sex Pistols did a show there. You ever heard of the Sex Pistols? I don't know. Excuse my leave, I pulled that out, all right? He's a... What are you doing, you fucking shit house? <laughs> Filming my bald men. Fucking liberty with this geezer. <laughs> Where's the Notre Dame Hall? Do you remember that place? Notre Dame Hall. Notre Dame Hall. It was round here. We did a show then. We did a gig. It's round here somewhere. Hey, Dave. Hey. Where's the Notre Dame Hall? Look, stop fucking about and stand up. Oh, you are standing up. I'm standing up. When you're smiling, Smile. when you're smiling, the whole world <laughs> smiles with you. This is colossal, by when the way. When you're laughing, when you're laughing, ha ha ha, the whole world laughs with you. <coughs> don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. Where's the Notre Dame Hall? He just fucking skims tickets, he don't know. Huh? Well, but why did he call me? When, when, in, in, in LA? How long have you been here? About a week, I've been busy. Look, can't you see? I'm fucking tight ranging about with you, poncing about. Going to fucking grasses, getting spanked, what's up with you? <laughs> <laughs> so what is the Notre Dame? It was just, it was, it, it wasn't like... Oh, I know where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Is it it's called, it's a theatre now. Yeah. That's right. One second on the left. That's it. Yeah, this was it. This is where I prayed. I think the entrance was down there, downstairs, or there was another entrance. We played there once with uh, Glenn, and this is where Sid was introduced to Nancy. He brought her down here for the second gig. What was the feeling? <laughs> Great up. Not that. good. Bad vibes. And this is when Sid started fucking about with the dope when she came on the picture. But there's another, there's another venue, another venue that bands don't play at where we were just picking our own places, which is such a genius thing to do. Strip clubs, churches, prisons, you know, not the norm. And it makes a difference when you, when you don't do the norm, you know, for all you youngsters out there. Now, my car is over there. I got um, deputed to sell one of Steve's acquisition guitars one lunchtime, and I went in there and had a go at selling it in my own particular Glen Matlock way. They took ages checking it out. I thought, oh, I wonder what's going on. And the guy's kind of sort of winking at me like that. And I thought, oh, I'll just wait. Next thing, there's a Black Mariah turned up and I'm handcuffed and slung in the back of the thing because Steve's guitar was even hotter than I thought. And in full view of all the students and my, my tutor, I was carted off to West End Central. And there's the Cambridge again. We'd always sit upstairs and discuss our strategy with Malcolm and that. Many nights was we spent here. Sometimes McLaren joined us, did interviews here. And it's still here. This is like one of the, one of the few things that's still here and that could pass for 1976, 77. But it's upstairs we went, you should go. I'm telling you, this is like exactly the same. This is one of the only things that you will find. It's old DVD that is the really the same. Huh? It still looks pretty much the same. Either the owner's a real cheap bastard, or he wants to keep it authentic, one of the two. Um, but I had a pretty good jukebox up there, and I did get the idea for one of our songs, from one of the records on there. But I won't say the bit, you can work it out for yourselves. Have you changed it? No. Not for only one bit. I'm still an idiot. Was there a strip club around there called the El Paradiso? I ain't got a clue, mate. See, told you. Here we are in Brewer Street in Soho. But I'm pretty damn sure that used to be a place called El Paradise where we did a semi infamous gig. Um, in a strip club, we hired the place for the night. The lady, the dancers were in the back room, and we'd come on for like about an hour, and then it went back to normal as a strip club after that. 
have a tiny little stage with the little footlights around, you know, where they used to have like burlesque girls getting their kit off and stuff. We took it over for the night and had a private party. Some of the girls who worked there, and they came in, so they gave us a bit of a strip as well as an opening act kind of thing. Except I think Susie thought she could do it better and got up and did a turn. But it was funny because it was filthy in there. I remember going setting up for a sound check and us as a band went and bought some disinfectant and a broom and a bucket and just gave the place a big shrews around before we played. Let's have a look. Fully equipped schoolgirl secretary uniforms. See the trouble is it? All these are fucking bogus pictures. Not one of them's a real picture, so you know full well that when you go to any one of these, none of them are gonna be there. It's gonna be some old fat old scrubber with a beer gut. You're definitely gonna get that when you show up, I'll tell you that. All right. Look, Arjun Provocateur, the first shop, which is um, Vivian's. Living in Matthews kids own those places. Yeah, we're heading down now to Chinatown. No, I like them fucking three birds over Chinese. Gorgeous. No, I like a bit of duck, a bit of Peking duck. Not them ones though. They call it like they got fucking bird flu. What is that? <laughs> it looks like a fucking uh, an embryo of a fucking turkey. I wouldn't eat in this place. I can't help thinking that I'm fucking... This is like a Dickens fucking novel right here. Isn't it? It's like fucking Dickens. We didn't have the skills we've got. You always think like a fucking bucket of piss is going to come flying out the window any second. You know, we were kind of so how the lads were, they just knocking around. There was always some subterfuge of skullduggery going on around here. So it's only quite a fitting place for us, really. Right, now many is the time I've carried a bass down here and a bass amp and that till I get up the stairs again afterwards. We played here three or four times. We started off playing with next to no people here and then at the end of the summer of 1976 we had this place round with the, the first ever punk festival. Hmm. Well, this place doesn't change much. Where are we? I wonder if you can guess. 100. The 100 Club in London's Oxford Street. This was my bit. Paul, John, Steve Jones. There used to be a nifty little Chinese restaurant there. Actually, you could order your food before you went on and they'd have some egg foo yong ready by the time you, um, you finished playing. But yeah, it was just a real good kind of homely club that was ideal for us to cut our teeth in. When we started playing, it was just a few mates. It was like my mates from art school. I think Sid was more like that in the first gig. Some of these North London crowd. There was people sitting around the edges gawping at us. Um, in disbelief at the horrendous racket we were making. But then it became packed quite quickly and there was no room to dance. And I think because of that, that's when Sid invented the pogo. The pogo? Oh, God, that. Because you could do it on the spot. And like I went down there one, one week and there were all these hippies like doing it, you know, just going doom, 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 doom. You know, I just wanted to kick. I had this sick feeling of, like, embarrassment in my stomach, you know. It shows how gullible people are. Just asked Jeff, the man who runs the place, why there's no picture of sex pictures up, and he said, there's a good reason for that, they've all been nicked. The 100 Club dressing room. It's fantastic, isn't it? I'm sure there's... These, these walls could talk. There you go. How do you ever off, 
Denmark Street. Oh, it's always been Tim Pan Alley, yeah, it used to call it. It's where all the old songwriters came. You, this is where you would come to uh, buy all your sheet music, as it were. Here, beauty is created, for this is where music in all its forms is brought to the public. This is uh, number six Denmark Street. I lived out the back. We got this uh, rehearsal place, and it was a little room downstairs and a little place upstairs that we converted into like where I used to live. There's a picture of you on the wall. Is there? Yeah. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, that's lucky we run into you. Okay. Oh, done it up. I always used to worry about coming. It was always dark and it was all cellar with rats in there. And at night time we had no lights or anything. So we would uh, always be weary about them. And they would be in the rehearsal room as well, these rats, and they're running about all over the place. The Plague of London. And that actually yeah. started at the end of the street in St Charles. Yeah. So we've had two plagues of London now. A real plague and then punk rock. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to live here with Steve at some stage. Not the best of flatmates, but he might have said the same about me. It's all right to come through. <laughs> I'm Glenn, by the way. It's a lot smaller than that than I remember. This is where I used to live, but this, we had all cork on it. But you can see where John's done some drawings. Here's me, Fatty Jones. It's just John's likeness of me. I think it looks like me. Cool crap. <laughs> see, look, I'm not as fat as that. Not at all. I've lost a lot of weight. You had your teeth fixed as well. Oh, yeah, and them. It's good that you kept all this. We just had it all done up. We thought, oh, we'd, we'll spend a bit of money on the place and flash it up because it was a right dump. And John came in and goes, you know, I don't like it. It's all posh. So he started getting the marker out and, and we was all going, oh, no, he's ruining it, you know. How you doing? <laughs> Good one, Malcolm, though. Holding the cash. Nanny Sponger. Nanny Sponger, yeah. Was she ever in here? I don't remember now. She weren't allowed. That's Sid. It's a good likeness. What's he called him? Ego Sloshos. We had two beds set out there. My bed used to be here. Steve had a bed there, which he shared with quite a few people. <laughs> <laughs> there, and I had a bed there that I shared with some. <laughs> we used to have our own parties here. I won't tell you what went on. I can imagine. What is this now? What is this place? No, Agnes B, the fashion designer. Well, got any free clothes? <laughs> this is where we really kind of took it seriously. Um, it was just great having a base, you know, and somewhere to leave the gear set up. And we used to turn up here every day of the week. You know, so if there was half an idea floating around, we was in a position to do something about it and at least find out if it was a rotten idea. This down here, is, that's where we used to rehearse. We'd be rehearsing there, drums would be set up there with the amps and PA and John would be sitting in the corner scribbling away. Off we go, so that's Denmark Street. And uh, yeah, it brings back a lot of memories actually. Yeah, yeah. It's almost a tear coming to me. Oh, there's music everywhere. Oh, back out into the real world. That's what it would be like. It'd be like our own little sanctuary in there, you know, all self contained area. And then we'd come out into Soho and be like, wow, full on, you know. And I loved it. Because I'd come out here and I'd be right here in the West End and everything would look like big and great. That's where I found uh, prostitutes because all around the other side was all the little entrances with little red lights on and I would go up there and pay 10 quid and get me end away. There used to be a wimpy bar up there that I used to go to all the time. I know that. I used to love wimpies. Remember wimpy bar? Yeah. And then benders and a frankfurt with a tomato and some pickle in the middle. And a lot of these guitar shops around there, I also used to uh, get a load of guitars stolen. The alarms would go off. We never got caught, you know, did it loads of times. You just get a brick, you pick a brick up and you go wallop and you just go in and just take it all off. You have a van. Or a the road. Or 
you know, yeah. Yeah, that looks Let's familiar. Look. See, look, he's the only one who's got the things on the front. So you can't smash the windows anymore. Malcolm, well, he shit himself initially he, uh, after the Grundy show. We didn't know nothing happened, but he was like panicking. We've got to get out of the studio. He's running. The police are coming. The police are coming. <laughs> I'm going to complain to ITV. <laughs> we didn't know nothing about it, and we went. We were staying at Denmark Street at the time. Me and Steve were staying there. We woke up in the morning. All these press were banging on the door. Do you know what's happening? We're going, well, what? It goes, it's all gone mad. We was looking at the papers, all the headlines. Hill from the Fury, we were running down Oxford Street and they were chasing us down here. Like, we ended up in Dryden Chambers, you know, our sanctuary. And man in the barricades, you know, like uh, keeping them all out, shutting the doors and everything. Oh, it was crazy times. You wouldn't believe it, honestly. This used to be Dryden Chambers, would you believe? That is now Clark's shoe shop. And uh, this is where the office used to be, and Malcolm's and everyone. Everyone knew this is where the Sex Pistols offices were. You used to get some Ted's hanging about outside, waiting to bash up any punky-looking people who came in, in the door. So you had to be careful when he was coming down here. And this is where Sid shot his famous little bit in the rock and roll swindle, where he's selling all these mugs and everything in the doorway here. Who else wants something? Come on if you want something, you cunt. <laughs> they might ruin my hair, dude. Who wants some safety pins? Want a mug? Oh, I'd love to have fucked the Queen when she was younger. You know what action men are, don't you? Oh, <laughs> Soldiers, they kill people. Anything else going free? No, there's nothing left. Nothing you can all go home now. Yeah, Now here we are at St Martin's School of Art where I attended in about 1973, 74 and then I left in the summer holidays of 74 because I got involved with the Sex Pistols and as you can see we did our very first gig here. They put this up a couple of years ago as a kind of mock tribute to us. They asked me to unveil it, that was quite nice. But what happened was nobody wanted to be social secretary that year so I came in and booked our very first show here, the first day of term, and then went to the bursar's offices and said, I'm not coming to do your degree course, I'm joining a rock and roll band. And I thought they were going to say, oh, Glenn, please stay, and they didn't. They went, oh, all right then, so I was a bit scuffered after that. The gig itself was, I don't even know if it quite qualifies for a gig. We only got to play about four numbers. We were supporting a band called Bazooka Joe, and the deal was I'd arranged that we used our equipment to save lugging it along the street, because we didn't have the van or anything. And then about half an hour before we were supposed to go on, they decided they, would, they didn't like the cut of our jib and wasn't going to let us use the equipment. So we had to go and back to Denmark Street, trundle all our stuff down, get it right up six flights of stairs in the rush hour. So we weren't happy and they weren't happy with us because I think they perceived us as some kind of a threat. So words were said. Then after about four numbers, somebody pulled the plug on us. And it just led to a big kind of punch up and um, that, that was it, really. Who's that there? That's me. If someone had told you while you were hanging around on your play loop that there was going to be a book here of us, no, I wouldn't have believed them, to be honest with you. Did you know it was going to be big when you carried the gear over the road? What was going to be big, the band? Yeah. I had no concept, no idea. It was exciting, I knew that. Shepherd's Bush still looks as dingy as it always has done, so it hasn't changed that it's much. It's a shithole. Now you can get all papayas and aloe vera down here, so it has gone a bit upmarket, I guess. Just a few more turbans than they used to be, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not political correctness? <laughs> get, get the pretty liberal. That's it, get them in. Get the turbans in. There was a shop down there called Stewart's where we used to get our tonic suits made. It was this Jewish tailor. All the skinheads used to get our, uh, our suits made up for about 10 quid. Look, cassettes. Who the fuck has cassettes still? The Schneid ones, isn't it? Did you buy cassettes? Didn't used to buy anything, mate. Just like that. Look, look at that funny thing up there. Look, look at that up there. Look. <laughs> 
So where did you two meet then? He went to Brackenbury School and I went to Flora Gardens. And I think when we were about 10, we used to cross paths. Like you used to go one way and I went the other way. And uh, I don't know how we first ended up talking to you. Well, you only live around the corner from me, didn't you? So we was kind of bound to... Our, mum, our mums knew each other as well, so they, they were friendly and so on. And we were in a similar fashion, I guess, when the skinhead thing started. We were both into that before we kind of met, I think, weren't we? Yeah, but we both both went to the same secondary school anyway, didn't we? So it's coming down memory lane, isn't it? It used to be called Christopher Wren's School. This is where we f went to school, me and Paul. So that's secondary school. And yeah, when they started making these lists of schools, this one came... Uh, very low. Very low on the list of schools in the whole of the UK. So they brought a new headmaster in and changed the name to Phoenix to give it a facelift. And, and I think it's been... Uh, really improved since he got here. The reason I think it was so rough because there's an estate over there called the White City Estate where there was a lot of herberts. There was a lot of nutcases came from there who came to the school, you know. Was it a mixed school? Did I mean did I shag any of the birds is what you're saying? Is that what you're hinting at, Julian? Uh, I can't say that I did. I lost my virginity when I was 13 and it was in Battersea Park. Watch out. Here comes the headmistress. It was in Battersea Park when it was a fun fair, and I fucked this bird over the miniature railway, over the Flying Scotsman, when it was in the garage. I don't remember doing any birds here though. I remember oh, nicking a car once, and I thought I'd show off and come to school in it. And I was showing off like, you know, no one our age had cars in, and I wasn't paying attention, and smashed into this other car. And I just remember getting out and legging it over in the White City Estates. And I thought, oh no, it's all over. But for some reason, no one ever reported it or anything. It was the weirdest thing. It was the best thing ever. I actually kind of like going to school. Yeah, we had such a lot. I mean, you, you, was, uh, you was away a lot of the time, weren't you? <coughs> yes, in other schools. We are in Shepherd's Bush, and this is a place called Stamford House. I've got some trendy name for it now, Safer Community Division. Basically it was a remand home that whenever you get nicked and you had to go to court, they'd hold you in here. It was juvenile, it was a juvenile place and I was, I, th I think I was in there like, I think it was three times for some reason, I remember coming back here. But Paul used to uh, wave, him and Mackin, Jimmy Mackin, used yeah. to come and wave to me. You used to have windows there actually, you could see out and He'd be up there like that, waving, you know, help, help. Oh, we'd, this was it here, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And um, we'd just like come and have a laugh and scream and, scream and shout while we was there, you know, until he, until he got pulled away, I guess. You know? Yeah, look at it. You must have made you feel great, wouldn't it, seeing us outside here? And... Well, I'd rather be on this side right now than in there, I'll tell you that. It was very nice. It was a bunch of uh, other kids who always wanted to have a fight with you. Bring back happy memories, eh? Horrible. We'd always cut through here to the, um, coming from school on the way to the pie mash shop. That's a bit of pie mash. Yeah. Oh, oh, come on, let's go. <laughs> Morning. Morning. Morning, what can I get you? Double pie mash, please. Pie. <coughs> Double mash for me, yeah. One pie. Yeah. You have a piece of it? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Never been a fish and chip people, have we? Yeah, never. Fish and chips wasn't our thing. We used to come here for school dinners, actually. No, nobody used to have school dinners when we was at school, so we used to just about make it in the hour, didn't we? Run down, run down from school and uh, have pie and mash and then uh, skip back. And is it owned by a relative? Cooks? No, no, I wish it was. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, if it was. Yeah. It still charged me, though. What is it about fine match, dude? Hmm? What is it about fine match? Don't talk to me right now. <laughs> I'm in heaven right now. A lot of people think it's unhealthy, but it's not. It's actually a meat pie, mashed potato that's got nothing but just mash, and liquor, which is like parsley sauce, and I believe it's potato water. Yeah, secret recipe. They'll never tell you what it is in the, in the liquor. But you know, and it's really filling as well. When we were kids, we'd come down here, wouldn't we? Stuff ourselves. I mean, this was a and it's good this value, was a for the two, two of us, you know, and, and two teas and all. I like it. You come in, you order it, you sit down, you've got it right there. You don't have to fuck about waiting. It's quick. 
Instant. You know what I mean? Cures all ailments. It's comforting. Mm. There's no other word for it's it. It's really good comforting, but especially on winter days like these, it's always it's, it's always boiling hot, isn't it? Also, you've got to put loads of vinegar on it. That's a big part of it too. And salt. <laughs> and pepper. And white pepper. <laughs> Whenever I come here and have pie and mash, my glands always, my fucking head gets like a fucking melon. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's something in the pie and mash, I don't know if it's the vinegar, but I think I'm allergic to something. But I don't care, looking like I come. As long as I get that taste. Oh, I love it. This is the only thing I'd miss about London, living in Los Angeles, is pine mash. If I was Bill Gates, I would uh, uproot one of these places and just move it over there, and the people, and just put them on a retainer, just for there all the time. You know the most pies I had in one day? It was eight pies. That was the last time I was here, like five, five years ago. <laughs> Who, ate all? Who ate all the pies? Well, it's like when English people go to Los Angeles. They're in the sun 24 hours a day. And what it's like for me when I come back here, all I want to do is eat pie and mash. Because I know I'm not going to have it much longer. You know what I mean? Yeah. How you pints? How you like them, boys? Yeah. Thank you. See ya. So there you go. That's your pie and mash for you. We used to go down King's Road. Get, get plastered on the weekend, and we always used to get a cab back to this one spot. Stop here. Stop we'd here. Stop. Pull in here, sir, cab driver, and then, then what happens? We'd make, we'd make out, we're getting our money out, we'd be fighting around. We'd, we'd, get out we'd, cab. Al we'd always leave one person there saying he's paying. Yeah, right? he's paying. He's we'd paying. Get, we'd fiddle about you, with the money, and then, and then wallop down that fucking down that, that that little alley, and, the, and the, they couldn't come after you because they're in a the cab. Go. Oh. We'd be giggling our asses off like we are now, that wouldn't would be we? It. <laughs> Worked every time. Is that your missus? Yeah, isn't it? Oh, it is as well. La, la, right. La, la. La, 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 la. We never got caught. Cool. I mean, we used to do this near, near enough every weekend for like two or three years. Gold Road Station here, where we used to bunk over the turnstiles. We get the train a lot, you know, we, you could just jump over them back then. In the old days, there would just be a ticket connector, wouldn't there? Right, well, so how'd you get in there? Now? Just walk through, run through. Just say, oh, the mate's got these me. wooden ones, and you could just jump over them, no problem. I mean... Have you got the permission to do Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. From London Transport, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's impossible now. Yeah, permits. Permits. Can I see them, please? Yeah, we've got permits, yeah. There's see, this, permit. is, this, is, this is like one day you can't film anywhere, really? you know what I mean? You have to have a permit. What are the permits? Bucket permits. Piss off. <laughs> now you've got bleeding cameras everywhere and you can't do nothing now. It was a much more fun being a tear away back in the you know, late 60s, early 70s than now. I mean, he never paid for a tube ticket, he just jumped over. So this is um, Carfew Road, where I grew up as a young kid. Steve, Steve lived just around the corner, actually, and that's, that's how we met. And this is where we used to hang out all around, the, all around these roads and get, get up to all sorts of things, and, um, which is now kind of all quite nice and <clears throat> middle classy. Back then it was a bit more rough. The majority of the houses now are private. They were mainly council houses and everyone's bought them since then. And uh, so it's gone up market, as they would say, and then they'll call it the Brackenbury Village. <laughs> we all moved around, everyone moved around. Steve ended up, John, moving to LA and stuff like that. And I ended up moving all around London, but uh, ended up moving back around here eventually. So I uh, still kind of live and uh, got uh, roots in the area, as it were. A lot more kids about then, or less cars. It was empty, the roads were empty, and kids would play in the streets and stuff like that. And there's my mate, Prince, hello. Oh, there he is, get him on camera. There's the street alley cat, he's still here. <laughs> this used to be the local bakers, actually. I used to get up at 
six, five in the morning, come up here and do a baker's round, just delivering to all the local shops and delis and stuff at freeze in the morning. On a bike? Yeah, on a bike, on one of those Hovis bikes. You see, like, all the, all the bread used to fall out all over the place. But I used to love the <laughs> fresher rolls in the morning, like ham and cheese rolls. The smell, the smell of um, freshly baked bread and stuff was fantastic. And also, there used to be a news agent here I used to do a paper around there for a little while as well, all jobs like that. So I was always working, trying to earn money and stuff, even when, you know, since we was little kids and that. 13, yeah. 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 First of all, I used to live down here on a camp bed at the bottom of my mum's bed with a, a carsey out the back, one toilet, and we used to have a bath in a tin bath that we used to fill up with hot water. And then I think we moved up there to that first floor for about a year. My parents were on a waiting list to get a council flat and we finally got one in Battersea. So we had to up, move everything to Battersea, but I didn't want to change schools because all my mates were still there. So it was a real trek in the morning, getting a bus and a train and a bus and a train just to get the, it was a drag really. I didn't want to move to Battersea. I didn't, I didn't like it over there at all, but this was a real shithole. As far as the, the the flat was way better, at least I had my own bedroom here. I was always like, on the couch or on a camp bed. So, But when you don't know any better, you, it, it's all right, you know. Okay. There was a coal cellar down there that I used to put tons of knit gear, like tons of it, like guitars and saxophones and bicycles. It was like a Pandora's box down there. What about your parents? Little, little treasure chest, huh? Did your parents know about it? They didn't really know, to be honest with you. No one went in there in these coal cellars. No one used them back then for coal or nothing. I'm glad I'm not living here anymore, I tell you that. I'm glad I'm living in Beverly Hills, thank you. This is number 50 Hemlock Road. And this is where uh, Wally Nightingale used to live, right here. That bedroom there was where, was where all the magic started while he had one of my stolen guitars and we were learning faces songs. He thought he was Ronnie Wood. He was delusional, by the way. We used to sunbathe out the back. His parents were very liberal and let us do what we want to do. It's weird being here, actually. It seems like a thousand years ago. It's the strangest feeling. In a tiny little fucking bedroom. Well, at least he had a bedroom. I didn't even have a fucking bedroom. All right, see ya. Well, this is Hammersmith Bridge. The river was a big part of our lives, really, growing up around Hammersmith. These pubs over here we used to go into, the Blue Anchor. My nan used to live there, and I lived with my nan when I was really young. So I was always around here, this area. We used to watch the Oxford and Cambridge race here. Everyone today, not just here at Putney, but all over Britain, and however old, is either Oxford or Cambridge. We get on our Richmond, bikes. We get, get on our, our bikes. We get on our nick bicycles and drive up to uh, right up to Richmond, Richmond. Really. Ham, all past that way. So it was a big part of our lives, really. This. And this school over here, St Paul's, was a real tough school. And I used to go in, and when I used to play rugby, and nick all their money out their pockets while they were playing rugby. Took from the rich, to kept, kept for myself. <laughs> In the background is the Queen's Wolf, but that's where, that's the building where we used to rehearse when Wally was in the band. And that's where uh, his dad used to have a contract there with Lee Electrics or something. And we had the use of there to rehearse there for about, how long was we there? Like, oh. sitting like forever, like months, yeah. when it's six months. Oh, well, over a year, I think. John never came in. Yeah, really. before John joined this the band. It was just me, Wally, Glenn, Paul. Nick Kent came down and jammed in there once. I had all the equipment, the bar, the rehearsal room, the parties. Just had to learn to play then. So. Um, well, this is the uh, Riverside Studios, as it is now. This is where we used to rehearse, again, into the main studio, where I think it's one of the rooms where we used to rehearse. 
Oh, it's changed a bit, yeah. <laughs> it was actually a lot bigger than this room. Yeah. It's, we had, they they uh, completely changed yeah. it in this whole place. This whole place, was, there was no one in here. It was kind of derelict, but it wasn't smashed up. It was still pristine, but it was way bigger than so this. It was one big room then, yeah. and we had the running of the whole Soundproof. place. Soundproof. No one would use it but us. We had Did You Know Wrong? and another one called Scarface. And I think that was about it as far as originals. And I remember we used to do Small Faces. What else did we do? Faces songs. Didn't we do Miss Judy? Yeah, anything really. We was just messing around at the time, learning to play basically, you know, and uh, just learning our instruments. So we'd just whack along to anything. And, and we did one show as, as this line up in here at Salter's Cafe, which was a down King's Road and there was a party upstairs and we actually played that as me singing Wally on guitar, Paul on drums and Glenn on bass. I think we did about three or four songs. That was the only other time we played with yeah. Wally in the band. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if it, I don't think it was the Sex Pistols, maybe yeah. it was the Strand or something. We didn't we didn't really Swankers. have a name then, yeah. It might have been Cutie Jones and the Sex Pistols, I'm not sure. But it was a disaster. <laughs> I know that. You know, I didn't really like the singing part. That front man thing is not me. You know, and that's that's when we had to, that's when we got Malcolm came down a few times. We just had to make a decision. You know, get rid of Wally, sling me on guitar. We had to leave the place because his dad was running it. You know, and um, that's when we went on as a free piece. We had it all. We had it all. All apart from an audience. It was all too cushy though, wasn't yes. it? Yes. That's when we auditioned for a, uh, a singer. We needed to shift gears. What the Kuma Reed, now Budweiser. The Americans have taken over. Without Malcolm McCann, the Pistols would be either in jail or working in a brewery or... This is the old Watney's Brewery where I used to work. After I left school, I started an apprenticeship here, which was for five years it was meant to be. I last, I stayed for four, actually. And while I was here, we used to be rehearsing all the time, so I used to come and do a day's work from seven till four, then shoot straight off to rehearsal. It would be a full full day, really, and I'd just be getting home, and I'd just be exhausted at night time. When we was at uh, Riverside Studios, it's handy working in the brewery. I used to supply everyone with a beer. We used to get big kegs. I used to come round here, manage to get a keg out, so we'd have a supplier beer down at the studio, which was always handy as well. It's kind of one of those jobs where you've done it, you had your apprenticeship, and you'd be here for life, but I hated it, really, to tell you the truth. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to leave. It was just like freedom when I left, you know, and, Join the pistols, it was great. It was like a bit like a prison to me, tell you the truth, you know. Well, the day I left Watney's actually was the day we had a gig at Chelmsford Prison. I walked out of Watney's for the last time I was leaving. I had to get straight on the train down to Chelmsford. We'd been having a few drinks all afternoon because I was leaving and I was pretty pissed by the time I got to Chelmsford Prison, which was a pretty riotous gig anyway. And I think I ended up just falling off my drum store at some, some stage during the gig. So that, that was quite a memorable day though, because it was so great just to leave this place. I was like that, I was off. See ya. <laughs> well, here we are outside of where I lived up from when I was born till about, um, I was about 16, 17. Number 18, Ravensworth Road. It didn't have stone cladding back then, I must point out. We had a little bit more taste than that. We actually lived Upstairs, we had a tin bath which we kept on a nail out the back in the in the garden. But it was hardly a, a middle class enclave around here, as you can see. Number 28, my nan lived, and my uncle lived just there. And so there was a real community thing. Well, the bloke who lived there, he was the local coalman, and instead of parking his car here, he used to park his horse and cart, and then the horse would spend the night over there. So there was always a nice big pile of horse dung outside here. So you, when he was playing football in the street, you had to make sure you didn't get your um, your plimpsoles in it. They weren't trainers back then, they were plimpsoles. So there you have it, Ravensworth Road, Kensal Green. Hardly the most salubrious place in the world, but it was home and I liked it. We're outside Princess Frederica Church of England Primary School, which I came to from about 1960 to 1966, 67. 
ain't changed much really. And it was kind of quite an interesting area back then because we're just up the road from uh, Labrick Grove. And it was a very, one of the earliest kind of mixed race communities around here. I mean, after kids here were West Indian extraction. And in the summer, you walk down the road, everybody would have their windows open and there'd be all blue beat pounding out the windows and stuff. So it was quite sort of funky and happening in a way. And then I remember some of the older guys, you know, it was the birth of the hippie kind of thing going on down the Portobello Road. So there'd be guys walking around with bell bottoms, you know, and Afghan coats and all that. I was always aware that there was something going on, that there was other things in life other than the nine to five and the, the straightness of the life that your mum and dad foist upon your shoulders. There was a big fog, I think it was 1963, it was like the last of the pea supers. I remember walking down the street and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Yeah, we, didn't, we didn't get sense. fog, that was too expensive for Shepherd's Bush. Didn't get out of the fog. <laughs> <laughs> London fog was a clothesline, I never liked it. We were here because this was the last place that I had my last pint with Sid, and I think Sid had his last pint in the UK before he went to the States. You know, there's a lot of history. We were both bass players in the Sex Pistols at separate times. We was not supposed to get on, but we kept bumping in, into each other around here because of mutual friends and stuff. And we were sitting in, not this pub, but another pub down the road one day. And Sid said, well, you know, what's all this about we don't get on? With? I said, well, we're sitting here, aren't we? And he said, well, how can we prove it to other people? And I said, well, how about doing a gig? And he went, oh, that's a good idea. Two or three days after having a discussion, we did a gig at the Electric Ballroom. It was like a one-off thing, the vicious white kids. And it was just about two days before Sid went to the States for the first and last time. And we had a pint in there to discuss the gig and say ta -da to each other. And I think he was some kind of born frontman. Nowhere in the league of John, you know, in terms of being a lyricist at all, but we, we was just doing covers, so that didn't even come into it. He, he just wanted to have a go at trying to do something outside the pistols somehow, you know, and be Sid Vicious. What a shame, such a lovely team has to play in this environment. You know, it's cold, isn't it? It's impersonal. Now, I grew up on Benwell Road, right, in my early youth, which is the road this site is off of. We had two rooms, six of us lived there until I was 11, and then we moved to Six Acres Estate, which is the other side over there, Finsbury Park. Uh, at that time, when we were that young, we had no indoor toilet. It was an outdoor loo, open to the public. Now, I never thought that that was a bad thing. Nobody around here did, because everybody lived the same way, and it was all right. It's... This, you know, from that, is a juxtaposition of events, and I don't see the in-between. I don't see the logical progression. I think this is disassociated with what actual real working class people had to grow up with around here. How am I supposed to relate to this? I grew up being an Arsenal supporter since I was four years old. I don't, I don't gather this one at all. You are my Arsenal, my only Arsenal. You make me happy when skies are blue. You know I love you, I'll always love you. But fucking hell, who took the arsenal away? No smoking on the premises? Fucking hell, needs torching. That new emblem, right? I'm oh, sorry, I grew up a proper gooner. Look at that plastic fucking cannon made in Italy. That's a joke. That's sad. You have let me down, you fucking bastards. I grew up supporting you. And I get that, the fucking thing's facing the wrong way. Your locals, right? Yeah. yeah. What is this now? To, what have they done to Arsenal? Made it good and better, bigger. Made it good and big and better? Yeah, yeah. No, don't be daft. Yeah, of course. You prefer don't be hybrid. selling us old folk down the river. <laughs> oh, Mr hybrid. Lydon, peace and love. I grew up on this road. Is it? I'm just down there, from down there. Yeah. I've seen you before on TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, doing something salty, I hope. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> Odd. And that used to be a girls' school. That's where we used to go, like, sneak in and look in the windows at the, the frilly right nippers. There. Yeah. I did do some time for, like, getting caught there. What, in prison or just detention? 
Detention, yes. No, juvenile, the whole lot. That's what it's like. Still is, though, innit, young men? Grow up. Nice to see you, to see you nice. Yeah. Thanks for that. All right? Yeah, take it easy. See ya. This used to be all bomb site area. You know, after the war, they never repaired it. And we grew up, like, tinkering with broken, blown up bits of things. And it used to be all right. I got bitten by a rat there once and I had to have a serious tet tetanus shot. But then I got bitten by a rat just about everywhere around here. That's how it used to be. I'm not saying that that was a good lifestyle, but God, we used to like each other as people. And they've turned it into this, this, this wasteland, right? Look at it. Where do I go to school? I go up this road here, and then I go across to a place called Eden Grove, which was a torture chamber run by nuns, right? And Catholic religion is a vicious, bad-minded piece of work, let me tell you. All right, I mean, I had many illnesses when I was young, and I'm not really healthy anyway, but those nuns, because I was left-handed, right, it was seriously bad news. You can't help when you grow up, whether you're left or right-handed, but to be constantly hit on the knuckles with a ruler, because it was a sign of the devil to write with your left hand, that, that teaches you something, doesn't it? Adults are fucked. You're all fucked. The country's fucked. And nobody fucked me. <laughs>
And they said, well, come down. So that's, that's what I did, and the next thing I was in. And I, that's when I became friends with Malcolm, and I used to drive him around to all the tailor shops because he couldn't drive in a little in Viv's Mini. So this was a, a regular haunt, and this is actually where it all started. We was then looking for a singer, because originally Steve had been the singer, and he was like, poor man's Tom Jones, really. Cutie Jones, yeah, and his Sex Pistols. Somebody had seen him and said, look out for this guy, John Lydon. Johnny Rotten. John had green hair and the safety pins. He had the safety pins going way before uh, Viv and I'd always see him in here and, and Sid used to march up and down here too. So when John came in, we met him in the robot after a shop and shop. I opened up the shop and there was a, an old Bell ME jukebox in the corner here and John auditioned about here doing um, Alice Cooper's 18. You know, it was weird. We was rehearsing by ourselves for for months before that, and all of a sudden, it would audition this guy who's like taking the piss. But there was something about the way he did it that we thought we'd give him a shot. Hello, I'm a cheeky chappy. London's great. I knew when I saw it, he was something special, you know. From Malcolm McLaren, boo you fucking bastard. The rest is history, as they say. After a while, they changed it and it became sex. The shop was called Sex. <laughs> How funny. Malcolm and Vivian owning a sex shop. They knew nothing about sex, nothing at all. <laughs> so rank amateur. And Malcolm and Vivian started doing like bondage gear and stuff. I mean, there was all crazy characters coming in back then. It's fun to sell rude you know, basically kinky sex gear to newscasters at the time, uh, because they didn't care then. London was different. Folks like that may be on the TV every night of the week, but they didn't mind about, you know, their more excessive kinky habits. I remember a bloke coming here once, he was asking the price of, like, rubber stockings and all that, and he had this big, long, sort of rubber mat on. And it transpired, he was fiddling with himself, you know, while talking. And then when we announced the price of the most expensive item, he went, oh, I've got to go. <laughs> and there's a little trailer of his, um, his seed on the front. <laughs> but this place was buzzing, mid-70s. It's changed a lot. No vibe down here. was a very good friend of mine, right? Not my best friend, but the bear we knew him as, right? He, uh, he did security for the pet shop boys, and uh, the Russian promoter managed to drive him into a tree and then into a river, and he died in Russia. So this is celebrating his death, because there is no death, there's life after. If Denton's anywhere, he's looking after the pearly gates for the rest of the herd. Have you heard? We are the word. You know, you've always got to remember your mates and things. Things like the death of a mate really, really hurts. It's the same way I felt when Sid kicked the bucket, you know? Like when I did the filth and fury thing. I mean, those are real tears in my eyes. And, and many people said, how can you do that, cry on camera for your friends? If you can't cry for your friends, what life you got? Heaven is on this earth, I think. I'm a fat 50 black. And this is my back. I've just got back from a little bit of pheasant shooting. So Johnny went grouse hunting on his first Sex Pistol gig. That's typical me, just driving around London. I spotted it in a window in the shop and went, I like that. So that's traditional English. 
Yes, I fancied a brace of peasants. <laughs> Didn't I have to deal with, like, uh, you know, the press here? I'm thinking I'm advocating hunting. I'm absolutely against hunting or the slaughter of animals for any other concept other than food. All right? Nothing on this earth is there for our amusement to kill just purely for amusement's sake. <laughs> you know it's politicians I'm hunting. Duck! Rabbit! Shoot! He does take it out on you doing gigs like that with me because it, it's 100%. The songs I do, I care about what I say. I don't want to come across wrong, but I suppose in, in the modern world now, anyone who has an opinion is going to come across wrong. That's, that's how it's all been changed and altered. We've had all three faults stolen off us, but it'll come back again. There's always the nippers out there paying attention. I love punk. Right. Hate video games, superheroes, hate them. Punk. Well done, nippers. And there we are, quick shoot up the road to Islington. And there's, it does what it says on the tin. It's called uh, the screen on the green in Islington. It's a cinema most of the time, but um, I suppose in about ni early 1976, we played there. We was friends with this guy called Richard, Roger, Roger, Roger uh, who ran the place, and we was looking for slightly bigger places to play. And he let us play there after the films had um, finished on the midnight special on the screen on the green. We let the Clash support us. On the proviso that they build a stage. And they said, sure, we'll supply a stage. And they said, no, no. Get it wrong. It's not that you supply a stage, that you actually build it yourself. So they had to build the stage. And it was some kind of penance for doing it, so it was keeping them like that, you know, really. But how we ever got on stage with something that Mick Jones had put together, I don't know, you know. So was there a rivalry between you two bands? It was kind of a good natured rivalry, you know, I think. On my part anyway. We went on stage, John went to sing, and he caught his tooth on the um the microphone. The next thing is his cap had gone in the front row, so there was like Susie and Berlin and Billy Idol all scurrying on the floor looking for his coach, you know. Sorry, I lost my coat. That gig was like so absolutely fucking incredible that like my group, the Flowers of Romance, we just could never be as good as that and there's there's just no point being second best and like I was thinking of not being in a band anymore then because like I thought how can you equal that? That's the best gig I ever saw in my life. Johnny Rotten's going to take a bus trip through London for your dubious pleasure. London's changed, right? There's a movement here architecturally that's destroying our, our history and not giving us any opportunity for a part in our future. There's enormous buildings with foreign interests going up, left, right and centre, that do not relate to us as human beings. Come to sunny London in November. It's fucking great. The only good thing about this town now are the drugs, and there's none available. Oh, God, I'm doomed. As for drugs, just say no. That means more for me. Chelsea FC. It's nothing but apartments. It's a fucking shopping centre. <laughs> shopping scheme, that's what is that come shop with the shed. <laughs> I mean for a gig I wrote your future dream is a shopping scheme. I didn't really think it would turn out to be an actual reality. Maybe I was the catalyst that spurned this on, and it's all my fault after all. A couple of good things happened at the airport. But the funniest thing was the uh, the at uh, the passport control. The bloke was a Mohican. <laughs> this I find amusing. How, how things change, and, and now a Mohawk is like an acceptable immigration officer. <laughs> Life's strange. 
and it all it all comes down to it by points out it's just hairdos after all you know and that's why I like there's an alleged punk or whatever and we we're supposed to wear an outfit or a kit that you know, declared yourself as a punk. No, that's not what punk is at all, right? No uniforms, or all uniforms, but no rules, except the whole world. I'm Johnny Rotman, I love the Bee Gees. Not much, though. This is King's Road, right? Northerners would come down to see Chelsea and they, they'd come along the King's Road thinking, Corby, oh, so grand, oh, we'll see the swanky claw shops. And all it was was Malcolm and Vivian in their fishnet tights selling bleeding rubber tea hoses. Coming up is the beautiful sex shop of Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood. It is currently called the World's End. And believe me, that's where the world ends. Boo, you fucking bastard. I used to live in the road over Gunter Grove until they turned it into a lorry freeway. This was considered posh when I was young. This was like moving up from Finsbury Park to uh, this swanky end of King's Road. Yeah, that's seriously was like me doing myself, you know, the social networking. That's like two rungs up the ladder, I thought. No, it wasn't at all. It just meant I had to spend more money for less. But all my friends like to visit. We're heading towards London. Fabulous River Thames. This is it, the River Thames. Look at that ugly, ugly fucking building. Look, it looks like two testicles without the willy, doesn't it? Great. The only good thing there is the barges on the mud bank. There used to be a hell of a load of drug dealers that lived on these barges here. You know, it's not for me to cast aspersions about that sort of thing, but... <laughs> there used to be some good wild parties there, but that was 30, 40 years ago. Hello, poor people! It was a, a kind of a turning point when I came up to this side of town, because the swinging 60s had, like, just about died a death, right? But everyone wouldn't give up their long hair and their Rod Stewart perms. And there I was at my bright green carrot top. And it was a clash of culture. And I was seen as an outsider from, you know, that filthy part of North London. What am I doing up here, you oik? It used to be a laugh hanging out with Sid and the debutantes at the same time. It was incongruous, but it worked. More coffee, vicar. I'd like two lines of cocaine with that, please. <laughs> and uh, here on the left is uh, Battersea Park, just across the uh, River Thames. It's a wonderful scenic route. Battersea Power Station. Beautiful building, made famous by Pink Floyd. <laughs> uh, I think I preferred it when the pig was flying over the top. The best thing about it, and my dad would say this, is the cranes outside, because my dad's a crane driver. He would like that. Is that MI5? <laughs> Those boys know all about me. For years and years and years, I couldn't get visas uh, to live anywhere else but England, because uh, they, they wouldn't shut the file on me. And it, it, made, it made life very, very difficult. Uh, it's only last year I got a proper visa to stay in the US. And now that I've got that, I'm not sure I want to stay there. I, th I think I liked the aggravation. Uh, but it's bizarre how a chap like me, I mean, I'd, I've done no wrong to anyone. I just spoke a few, like, home truths. And that kept an open file on me, like I'm some kind of terrorist suspect. It's really compromising for me to say I love London, because I look in around. I don't know what it is I love at all. I, I keep. It's, it must be just the people. I don't think I could have written the songs I wrote unless it was in direct relationship to human beings. You know, you can't just think up anarchy in the UK one morning over coffee. It's about struggling through the market at 6 a.m. You know, for a bit of cat. Upper Street Market, lovely place. You could buy broken plates of china there for 20 quid a whole set with a one chip saucer. Hence the discount. In fact, my whole early life, I don't think I knew anyone that didn't have chipped teacups. 
you know, now that's considered, you know, ill health and disease spreading. <laughs> Architecture does matter. But architects, I think they might be the problem. They cause these dilemmas. Every, every so social unrest, really, is down to an architect. Every council flat badly designed. That's an architect that made that. And we have to then grow up and live in that environment and feel like rats in a cage. And our only chance of a, a, a night out is to come to areas like this, to go to the posh clubs, where, of course, they don't like us. Posh clubs owned by architects have built the council flats we come from. <laughs> They're murdering the place. Hello, poor people. Hello, poor people. I kind of agree with Prince Charles on this. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you doing? We're well, fine, thank you. There's nothing wrong with Georgian terracing. It's very nice, it's part of our culture in a weird way. And I'm all for being a part of the modern world, but not when we're left out of it. That's Pimlico train station, right, a subway. But the building on top of it, I mean, that's a penitentiary, isn't it? It's a lock-up house for the loonies. Houses of Parliament, my God. Hello, poor people! Hello, poor people! Nothing but cunts in that house. The cunts are in the house. I used to think voting might change something. I learned it don't. They're all a loss. Labour, Conservative, Democrat, Republican. Got to get rid of the whole lot of them. They're all liars. They're dirty old men and they're usually, what? There's at least two a year caught for some kind of child buggery. You know? They're worse than, they're worse than the church politicians. Probably the same people. They all end up wearing dresses. Where's all the police? Oh, they're all undercover, of course. They're dressed up as tourists to fight terrorism. <laughs> so daft, so British, so polite. Hello, poor people. I agree with you, mate. Yes, get them Arabs out of Iraq. Bloody hell, sort of place out. The home of democracy. And this lot caved in to George Bush and took us to Iraq. You know, no thank you. Guy Fawkes got it right. Poor old Guy Fawkes, a misunderstood comedian. <laughs> but at least he got an occasion out of it, you know. Guy Fawkes night. That's been like a celebrated, like, part of our culture for, for a couple of centuries at least. Uh, and it's an important part of our culture. We celebrate the fact that Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Uh -uh. But champagne socialism has now turned it into, oh no, you don't want to mention that anymore. Let's call it Halloween. What's Halloween to, to England? History's important, warts and all. It's funny, when I was in school when I was young, it was the one subject I loved most was history. And I used to row at the teacher a lot because I didn't believe what the books were saying and I was right. It'd be nice to stop off in the pub and have a pint. You know? But now take a look, right? After that lovely Houses of Parliament, you got that opposite. Do not tell me that's a compliment. It's rubbish, it doesn't usually work. It's horrible when you go up there. There's nothing to look at but a load of office blocks. It's a bicycle wheel without the tire. Blow it up, blow it up, blow that up. I don't like anything so far. So it's urban chaos, it's just one huge traffic jam. You can't get anywhere, no one speaks English. It's a wonderful town. Blair's Britain. <laughs> when trumpets blare. When I was young, right, this is what we used to do with some saucy girls that used to work there, you know, servicing the uh, MPs. Used to get a pint of lager there for one penny. Right? It was brilliant. It was the best place for drinking late at night. When the MPs really let their knickers down. Oh, they're all wearing frilly ones. <laughs> this is um, when we did the famous uh, Sex Pistols on, on the river in the, the Jubilee. This is where the police started pulling us up, right outside the Houses of Parliament. Um, it was supposed to be an amnesty of 36 hours, all pubs open, everything, everyone partying. Unless, of course, you were someone like me. 
Uh, they, they chased us down the river, arrested everyone. But I managed to get off because some very nice policemen, they were looking for Johnny Rotten, asked me where he was. So I quite happily pointed out to Malcolm McLaren and Richard Branson. I was ever so pleased to see them carted off. <laughs> I'm no grasser, but when it comes to fucking up Malcolm, he's over there. <laughs> it's everywhere, all right, and it's pervasive. I mean, that's a roundabout, right, and they plonk that in the middle so you can't see the other side. Surely that's like, you know, criminal. Blow it up. You don't have a view anymore in London. You're lucky if you can see 30 yards. Here's some lovely colours coming up on the left. Now, I'd like to say that's hideously ugly, but what I'm wearing is far worse. <laughs> I mean, my God, <laughs> what an atmosphere does that create? The best thing about around here is the hole in the ground. And watch out for police enforcement cameras. This building's pregnant. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? Well, enough of my moaning. I think it's about time we found a building I like. Stop at a pub. Stop at a pub. God, I love English pubs. I'd like a quick Guinness, if you don't mind, Julian. Yeah and a definite pebble dash in the toilet. Yeah, okay. I'm joking. You can't smoke in a pub no more. Well, when they're gonna ban the booze? Because that's the next step, isn't it? It really is prohibition. Rules, rules are for fools. But the good thing about rules is you need them first to know what they are, and then you avoid them. It doesn't work the other way around. Like anarchy, it's a mind game. I mean, Malcolm jumped on that. He thought, oh, oh, anarchy, oh yes, we can sell that. I don't think you're idiot. <laughs> it's done as a laugh. It's knees up Mother Brown. Britain's a culture that's continuously changing. Immigration has gone on in this island since someone got on a boat and came to it. But there's a Britishness in it. Every race that comes here ends up being British. I know that, because I'm Irish. I mean, I grew up like, what, Irish immigrant parents, you know, in a heavy Jamaican, Irish, Greek, Turkish, multi-mixture race called Arsenal, Finsbury Park. We, the concept of racism was always in other areas. I mean, we had to grow up and muck it in together. It was a melting pot. And when, it was really hard to, to go outside of Finsbury Park and have to deal with the concept of, oh, you're one of them mixed lot. You know, like this was a bad thing. It was astounding to us. You, you see, you see, my mates. It's all races catered for, all right. And we don't view each other as aliens. And you, you come up to swanky Chelsea, and it's you know the separation techniques. Divided we fall. One world, one race. But can we all speak English? <laughs> love me England. I love me Britain. Not too many folks here still do. Shame, innit? Expat, and I'm more loyal than anyone. This is the Queen, Mum. Loved her smelly knickers. Now you may add your insults. I ain't got none. That's what England's become, fags outside. Well, maybe that's the right choice. <laughs> this is what being an anarchist gets you. <laughs> Hello. All right. God bless. Hello. How's the cricket? Right. Good for a laugh. Any chance of England winning anything? That meant no. As you can see, I'm still as popular as ever. Everybody wants to sit next to me. 30 years of fame doesn't do you any good at all. It, it, it's, it's consistently trying to rob you of your real personality. This is like midday, and we're in a dodgy pub in a dodgy area, and I don't know anyone around, and they're all shy. It, it amazes me. I, I mean, I grew up as, well known as a shy bloke in London, and now I find I'm I'm not shy at all. <laughs> They've all become what I thought I was. You know, anarchy in the UK was a desperate cry for attention. <laughs> right. 
many called this London Bridge. Whatever the Yanks bought originally, uh, they, they moved to uh, Arizona, I do believe. What they thought they were buying was Tower Bridge. It's a glorious concept of architecture, this one. It really is. The way those, like, you know, roads open up. Novelty. It's really clumsy architecturally. It really is an ugly thing. But I love it because it's so British. Ugly. You see this glorious thing here, right? Lovely old up stone. Now, what is that? What is that? What they've done to this town is kill the culture. We know that's an alien object, right? It doesn't belong. And, and you cannot see that lasting, say, what, another hundred years? There's no chance of it. None at all. And that, that, look at that. What's that? A lopsided fucking scooter helmet. It's, ugh. It's wrong. Blow it up. I can't relate to this modern shit. I don't think anyone in the world can. It's corporations telling us that we don't count anymore that they own our world, and we merely exist at their pleasure. There'll always be an England. There will, you know, there will always be an England. Hello, London, how the fuck are you? Hello, Polish workers. Welcome to Blighty. The drinks are on me. Now, down there, right, Isle of Dogs that way, you know where the ships used to unload here, and, it, and they turned the Isle of Dogs, which was an incredibly hardcore working class area, into yuppie apartments. But you know what? You can't take the working class out of it. It doesn't matter what they turn it into. The Isle of Dogs will always be our kind of people. The Tower of London, a fantastic old structure. There but for the grace of God, I'm not locked up in tradition and history, as opposed to this glass thing opposite, right? And the excuse for this building is, oh, the glass work reflects the traditions and at the same time represents the modernity of the future. No, that's an ugly looking thing with a lot of pipe work. That doesn't reflect anything, except it tells us whatever my culture suffered for the bastards that used to run the Tower of London, has been reduced to a new load of bastards running London in glass fucking houses. You know? And these are the cunts throwing stones at me. Cheap. Oh, they're playing my music. It's my favourite rave tune. Oh, many a night I spent dancing to that tune. Look what a horse's ass London's become. <laughs> Get off the road, you crazy fool! Officer, do you have a license for that horse? <laughs> See his muggy little face? You know, all oh, those London bobbies, they're tough. <laughs> Fighting terrorism. All in the name of the Empire. Follow me? Proper goon of it. Oh, you're joking. And look where you end up. Fucking love me. Oh, then you're well into prostitutes and lesbians. Good on you. Yeah, good laugh them days. Still is. But yeah. London's become muggy. I don't know what's happened to it. Fucking champagne socialism, right? I see Melky bottled out of the jungle. Oh, of course he did. <laughs> When's that bloke ever committed to anything? Yeah. I remember him well. Yeah, fake. Well, See you later, enough, sir. Cheers. See, regular people. This is. I like that about London. You, you can just talk to blokes working on sites, and that's how it should be all over the place. You know, no class distinctions. Look at that. That is a coffee percolator. Uh, what is that building supposed to serve at? And look at the narrow road it's down. Uh, it's ugh, ugh, what? Look at Lloyd's. Lloyd! Bloody hell, all your piping's on the outside. That's awfully obese. I mean, that's unfinished, isn't it? It's like a gas works. That's another carbuncle on the horizon. Bloody hell! Have you ever taken an amplifier apart, you know, and you look at the insides? Well, there you go, there's a concept. 
I say, does anyone know who that gentleman is? Hello? Can you help me out? Who is that gentleman there? Does he represent anyone traditional? Oh, don't speak to me. Sorry. Officer. Even the police don't pay attention. <laughs> what a mellowed out town. <laughs> Fucking hell. He looks like George Bernard Shaw, and he was Irish. It's the Duke of Wellington. And he's not wearing a pair. Look, he's got no wellies on. See, here's British history. Lord Sandwich, he invented the sandwich. Wellington, the Wellington boot. I mean, we're a pretty industrious lot, aren't we? Rotten, what did I come up with? <coughs> that belongs in Japan, not here. It's in the wrong fucking place, you idiots. It looks like the side of one of them dreadful cruise liners that does them Caribbean specials. Blow it up, blow it all up, boom. It, it's so ugly, it's so antisocial that it just makes me really bloody angry. Guy Fawkes, oh my God, we've learned from you. Oh, mate, you are not missed. You are celebrated. I still like that idea of pizza coming into the flats to drink tomorrow. I've travelled the world so many times and I'm seeing all identity being crushed in every single country for this, like, name of what? Modern, cold, calculated commerce that just wants to sell us crap and wants us to take crap and shut up and enjoy it. There are so many cell phone company shops in London now. It's bizarre. Record stores are closing down to sell cell phones. For what? Who are you going to ring? There's nothing to say to anyone anyway, except bloody hell, what are you doing tonight? Oh, nothing, you know. Oh, of course. <laughs> London's full of people outside in the street smoking cigarettes or, or on a cell phone or both at the same time. It's not friendly anymore at least in this part. But then again, I don't think it ever was around here. It's always been about commerce, but with no sense of values. Uh, welcome to beautiful London. We're in downtown, I think it's the bank. Well, there's a bank somewhere nearby. Well, oh, you can bet on that. But there's also this glorious avoidance of the wondrousness of the Bank of England and the beauty of a one pound note. This is St. Paul's, break your neck. See, they've cleaned this up too. But in a weird way, I liked the stone all, all dark. It meant something, it meant it was substantial and stood there for a long time. Polishing it up like this makes it look like Disney World. Removes history. Leonardo da Vinci paintings in the Vatican, they want to clean them up and take the grime off. I mean, I'm sure the bloke when he painted them was well aware that they would deteriorate over time. Well, isn't that the point? Things are supposed to. Look at my face. In 30 years, it's most seriously deteriorated. Am I recommending a facelift? Certainly not. And I don't like to see it happening to old buildings. The point is that they're absorbing life. Things are supposed to shrivel and die eventually, but with grace and dignity. Look at the structures. Look back, please, right? It's a carbuncle of ideas, isn't it? You know, ode to a Grecian urn, really. Keats reference, God, I'm too good. <laughs> You've got domes, spires, pillars, cornices, and none of it matches. What a shame that it doesn't have matching clocks. Now, if that was an American designer, there'd be a clock on each pillar. I like them old statues. Statues do mean something. They are focal points and they do get you talking. It's always nice when there's a good statue at the end of the road. Fantastic that the Nazis never managed to blow this building up. My wife's German, I love her very much. She doesn't want me to be German, I don't want her to be English. We're supposed to be different. It's what makes us count in the world, that we are different. Those differences matter. It makes life enjoyable when you travel the world to see different approaches to life, different structures, different meanings and attitudes. Do we want the whole universe to become one big shopping mall? You know, a Britney Spears universe. And we know how mediocre that is. If I was a true anarchist, I would recommend Britney Spears to everyone, but I'm not. 
So carry on buying your Clash albums. Hello, poor people. Hello, poor people. Hello, hello, poor people. That might sound arrogant on the camera, but the people I'm saying that to, they know what the, like, the, the gist in this is. Because I'm still poor people. <laughs> I mean, I, I did this bus ride today thinking like, oh, yes, great, they'll always be in England. And I'm ending up really depressed by what I'm seeing. It, it's, it's gone wrong, all right? We've got to take this back off these silly sods. It's the Americanization of the universe, isn't it? Sooner or later, Britain will become a shopping mall for American tourists. And look at this, look, more glass structures, bloody ugliness. How long's that thing gonna last before the rust sets in? These are saucy, like, corporations. They're building these things as, as a statement, almost like oppressive, domineeringly. It's like, bugger you, we don't give a fuck about you anymore. We'll do what we like. Hello, sir, are you building something ugly? Yeah, destroy the city, yeah? Your, your Fucking joke, innit? There'll always be an England. <laughs> no, more poles on the outside. There's more poles in London than in Poland. And that's just on the buildings. Hello, disassociated peoples of the world. Isn't London a lovely town? Hello, indifferent yuppies. Everybody bored? Well, you made it this way, not me. I'm now a tourist, and I'm unamused. You fucking wankers. What have you done to London, cunts? Has anybody seen a cockney lately? Huh, I've heard they're an endangered species. They're going the way of the white baboon. Look at you, you cunts. You're all like clipped budgies, stuck in your fucking cages. What's happened to London? Hello, London. Do you still exist? Is there a London anymore? Is there a London anymore? It's bollocks, isn't it? Bollocks. Cunts. Where's my England? I want it fucking back. Cunts, cunts, cunts. Yuppie bastards. Hello, workers. Building a new car bunkle. Thank you for destroying my country. Blokes in suits. Anybody got a life in this town? Does anybody care anymore? Does anybody give a fuck? Is it worth it? Happy Arsenal! You are my London. Get back to work. Come on, you got some more cell phones to flog. Spot a real estate? Got a yuppie apartment in Westminster for me? Super. Fuck off, everyone, for no reason at all. Fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. He's swearing antisocial. <laughs> words like fuck, cunt, and bollocks, right? These are regular words to us. We grew up with them. It's the way you use them. It's the way now modern yuppie sport fucking bastards come down and, and try to reuse them. It is offensive when I hear a middle-class wanker go, oh, few off. Right, it's wrong. Got a life? Have you got a life? Have any of you got a life? Have you got a life, sir? Have you got a life? I bet you got a wife. That means you got no life. That looked like a policeman. I, I should be careful. Who built that? Who built that? I want my money back. Who built that? Blow it up. <laughs> you want a bus ride? Hello. Hello, poor people. Well, we're still following the police horse's ass. Right, that's how far we've gone. We've been beaten by a horse in traffic. <laughs> in the middle of London. <laughs> it's all right, London, though, really, isn't it? You know, where else can you moan like this? <laughs> I hate heights, I really do, but this is all right. I'm okay with this today. 
because I haven't seen London from this point of view except in an aeroplane. I can see trees and greenery way off in the background and the hills, so you still get a sense that this was once a country full of human beings. You know, a major city like London, full of history, and what does it really look like? Not a lot, mate, not a lot. Mugged out of our own country. It's a shame, right? Central London, and it's a bicycle wheel that stands out, all right? I don't know how many times I can moan about that ugliness, but I'm right, you know I'm right. It'd be nice to think I was an anachronism of the past. We had a future here that was worthy of talking about, but my God, I got it right. 30 years ago, I was bang on the money what they were gonna do to this place, and they've done it, and no one stopped it. They've murdered the town. It's hideous. God, I never thought when I was young I'd say Manchester was more pretty than London. <laughs> Even Scouseland. <laughs> Don't let the sun go down on me. It's nice, that, isn't it? It's nice. It's the only thing they can't take away from you, really, is the sun, but you have to be, like, 500 feet in the air to see it because London's now so overbuilt, we're really lucky that we can see a sunset because no one else in this town can. The sun is setting and so am I. Peace. Off. Teetering on the edge. Well, fuck it. Ah! Thank you, there is no place like London!